I just uh, verified this. We are live also on Facebook as well as our website. The advantage of being on Facebook is you can have a chat room and our children's uh, ministry director, Amber, is there and she is waiting to talk with you, answer any questions. If you have a prayer request, uh, if you uh, want some information about the church, you can put it right there in the chat room and Amber's there to address your needs right now. So please do that if you could. Church family in Christ, as we get into this message about God's people, a biblical response to racism, I want to say these words to you right out of the gate. Um, not all of you are going to agree on everything that I say. I'm going to do my best to be biblically correct. And if I can, uh, I will do so, but I want you to know that like every human being, I am flawed in my thinking sometimes and in my assumptions. I know that we are called to love our neighbor as ourself, and we are to speak the truth in love. Those are two things that are non-negotiable in the Christian life. And so let me just say out the gate that let's work together, friends. Let's work just as hard on unity as each one of us works hard on being theologically right. Can we agree on that? Great. Well, the year 2020, friends, has been quite a year of upheaval for the USA, not even talking about the coronavirus. The killings of George Floyd, of Ahmaud Arbery, of Breonna Taylor, and most recently the shooting of Jacob Blake have sparked a nationwide controversy about racial justice, both past and present. And equally bad, and this happened just uh, Sunday or Monday, equally bad was the shooting of two police officers down in the Los Angeles area in Compton. So a July survey came out. Barna uh, is a Christian organization that does research on trends in the Christian faith. Barna came out with a survey done in July, and, it, and they, these are the results. 25% of Americans think that the U.S. has historically oppressed minorities. Now, I read that and I said, are you kidding me? Are, are you sure it's only 25%? But that was up from only 7% the year before. So we're moving in the right direction. I think we still have some um, understanding to go to get there. 19% of Christians still say that race in America is not a problem at all. And that wouldn't be such a bad statistic, except compare it to 81% of black Christians say the U.S. definitely has a race problem. 33% of white Christians now say that U.S., our country, has a race problem. So we're trending in the, in the right direction of the white community, and I think these types of conversations will help us to get further in our understanding. But you can see just from the comparison of the white Christian uh, survey and the black Christian survey that we have uh, quite different perceptions in the racial reconciliation controversy going on right now in our country. My conclusion is this, that most Christians are now increasingly acknowledging there is such a thing in the past as racial oppression, but they do not acknowledge as much the present racial injustices. So here's a reminder. Now, let me remind her of what these messages, these four messages we're going to give, and maybe even an extra one at the end in October, these messages are not about. They're not about politics, although a lot of people will take them politically. These messages are not about police, whether you believe that blue lives matter and you believe, or you believe that we should defund the police either side of that uh, argument. These messages are not about either politics or police. These messages are about what God thinks about racism and about injustice. Now, just a reminder, we said this last week, I want to give you a reminder of our definition of racism. It is the belief that there are groups of humans who possess different behavioral traits corresponding to their physical appearance. And because there's different physical appearances and different traits and, and activities and behaviors, that those races can be divided and then somebody arbitrarily chooses that one particular race is superior over another particular race. It may also mean uh, when you combine racism, it could mean prejudice. 
It could mean discrimination or antagonism directed against other people simply because, not based on their behavior at all or anything, and not even knowing the person, that's what prejudice is all about, prejudging somebody, but because simply a person is of a different race or a different ethnicity. So let me come out of the gate this morning saying these other words, historically about racism in the United States and racism around the world. And the first thing is this, racism, number one, racism and slavery have existed for thousands of years in, in almost every culture, in every nation around this planet. It wasn't something that, quote, only happened in the United States. So that's, that is one truth. The second truth is this. In Great Britain, well, let me say something about the first one. In the United States, for example, in the Atlantic slave trade, and remember where, you know, 1619 is a big uh, number right now. It is, it is deemed the beginning of slavery in the United States when that Dutch vessel, the White Lion, brought the 20 captured Angolans over to Virginia, and they were uh, made indentured servants was the term they used, but they were really slaves. They were bought for victuals or food. That's when it began all the way until the official uh, government end of slavery in 1865. All the way up until that happened, there were about 600,000 slaves that were brought to the United States during those 250 or so years. But let me say this, 600,000 slaves were brought to the United States. There were 11 and a half million other black Africans that were brought to the Caribbean and Central and South America during that same time. So out of 12 million uh, black individuals that were brought over to the Americas, North and South America, only 5% of them were brought to the United States. So that is something to keep in mind. And then second, there were the first two nations on planet Earth that actually outlawed the importation of slavery from African nations. The first one was Great Britain in 1807. If you remember the movie Amazing Grace, it chronicles the life of a wonderful Christian man who was a member of the English Parliament. His name is William Wilberforce. Eric Metaxas has wrote a, written a great book about his life and his ministry. 1807, Great Britain prohibited the slave trade in the British Empire, and the U.S. followed. Now, sometimes we think, well, we, we went all the way to 1865 before we did anything. No, in 1808, the United States concurred with Great Britain and prohibited the importation of any further slaves into the Americas. The African-American population in the U.S. at the end of the Civil War was about 4 million people. So just so, you, just so you know the facts, that the U.S. and Great Britain were the first two nations on the planet that prohibited the importation of slaves from Africa. Now, go to 19, the year 1960. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is on Meet the Press, and he's the one who made this famous statement, I think that it is one of the tragedies in our nation, he said. And everyone knows this, that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, is the most segregated hour in Christian America. Later, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King used a reference to Jackie Robinson's book because he wrote a book. He says, everyone knows to use the life, uh, the title of Jackie Robinson's book, and he wrote a book called Baseball Has Done It, talking about racial integration. So in that book, uh, there's Jackie Robinson and there are Hank Aaron and there are a number of, of other African-American baseball players who helped break the color barrier into baseball. And basically, the, the book was written in 1964, and Jackie Robinson says, look, if baseball can do it, America, the rest of us can have racial integration as well. And, of course, Martin Luther King brought up that fact, and then he said, but friends, let's be honest, the fact is that the church has not done it. Now, fast forward to the year 2020, I think it's fair to ask that question. Has the church done this yet? Has the church broken this idea of segregation between the races? I mean, how many multicultural churches are there? How many multi-ethnic multi -ethnic congregations are there in America today compared to other church congregations where it's at least 90% of one single race or another? That's a fair question to ask. How far have we really come? 
Is that still true today? It seems that a God-fearing, Christ-honoring church should have people and should be welcoming people from all races and ethnicities, at least those uh, who speak the language of the congregation, like if, it, for example, in our church, it would be English. That would be a multicultural church. But sadly, there are not very many of those yet in America today. Now, go to Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, that famous speech on the Washington Mall in August 28, 1963. I was about six months old. I don't remember the speech. Um, but he said these words, when the architects of our great republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, he said, they were signing, and, and check this, this phrase out because this is very important, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. What was the promissory note in the Declaration of Independence? Jefferson penned these words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, all people are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's the promissory note. And later in hope, Dr. King said this, we refuse to believe that the bank of justice in America is bankrupt. Now, friends, we still live in an imperfect nation, and the reason is because an imperfect nation will always be full of imperfect people, and if we're honest with each other, we are all imperfect people. None of us has become completely like Jesus in the way we act or think or talk or feel about every other person. None of us completely loves our neighbor as ourselves as we ought to yet, but here's the point. Friends, we should be getting a little better with each passing generations. In past times, generation to generations, we've exceeded in that goal. In other times, it seems we've taken a step back. So you take a step forward, 1964, within a year of Martin Luther King uh, pass, or saying those words, I have a dream. Uh, in 1964, we have the Civil Rights Act where it became illegal to discriminate against anyone based on race or color or religion or national origin or sex. And you think that would have solved all the problems right there? I wish, I wish it did, but I think the Civil Rights Act was a beginning of making good on, quote, the promissory note that Dr. King referenced that all people, regardless of race, regardless of background, they are created equal and last week we saw that racial equality, racial equality was God's intention from the very beginning. Do you remember those words in Genesis chapter 1 when God created mankind? Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And he made them male and female in his image. And he said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so friends, it, God's intention, we are all children of God. We're all made in His image, red, yellow, brown, black, and white, a beautiful mosaic of variety, and every human being has equal value in God's sight. So let's go back to, okay, this is the way how God sees people, how God feels about every human being, equally valuable in His sight, all equality. Remember that quote that we had from Galatians last weak. There, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So there's God's dream, uh, but here's the problem. All of us have blind spots. What is it, friends, what is it that makes it hard for you and me to treat every other person around us as equal and equally valid? Because what we've proven, I mean, the Civil Rights Act came out in 1964. That's 56 years ago, and, and we're not there yet. So it can't just be about the laws in our country that make everything right. It has to be about the way that you and I treat each other every day. It has to be about the way you and I treat each other when we encounter each other at the store or in our neighborhoods or in a parking lot or at the movie theater if, we, if they ever open up again, or at the bowling alley if they ever up, open up again. In our neighborhoods, 
It matters what we mutter under our breath, even when we're watching a news program and we think nobody around us can hear or that everybody in the room around us agrees with what we're saying or what we're muttering. Because the truth is, friends, that we have what, is, what are called blind spots. Do you know what blind spots are? Every human being has blind spots in our eyes, in our own retina. They are somewhere in your retina, these blind spots. They're devoid of light receptors. And so these blind spots on our retinas, they, uh, they have no visual path to the, to the areas, the cortex of your brain that acknowledges the light and turns it into an image. These regions, these blind spots on our retina, they keep us from seeing things. Literally, friends, we do not see certain things whenever those blind spots are located. So a book came out in 2013, guess what it was called? Blind Spots, Hidden Biases of Good People. Hidden Biases of Good People. So they're also called mind bugs. Now what is a mind bug? Blind spot and a mind bug could be synonymous. They're automatic reactions that people have to certain races or cultures or groups or perhaps even genders of people. Mind bugs are the things that produce judgments and they cause unintended disadvantages for certain people. We do this without even thinking about it. We do this without even consciously knowing we're doing it. Um, it goes into every area of our life. It goes into social, political, racial groups. We can't see, sometimes, friends, we, uh, we do not see our own blind spots. Our hidden biases are capable of guiding our behavior, even if you and I are unaware of their existence. All of us have blind spots psychologically and socially. They, manu they manifest themselves in what we call hidden biases, and they impact us every single day, socially, culturally, politically, educationally. All the Lees, they cover them all. Um, they affect us in every area of life. We need to become aware of our own racial assumptions and blind spots. For example, here, just, here's an example. Um, how do whites feel when, uh, I'll speak as a white person, how do I feel when the lights of a police vehicle light up behind me? Well, the first thing I say is, I hope he's going after somebody else. I'll just get over on the right side of the lane and let him pass my officer. You go catch who you ever, whoever you need to catch right? And, and then he pulls over behind me some more, and I'm like, oh no, he's after me. But I tell you one thing I do not think. If I'm getting stopped for whether it's speeding or, as Lisa can well testify, not coming to a full and complete stop at every stop sign, uh, and I'm getting pulled over for a traffic violation, I tell you one thing that I do not think I do not think that I'm automatically going to jail. I do not think that if I reach for my registration and insurance in the glove box, that that could potentially be a movement that would trigger some kind of a violent reaction from the police officer. Do you see what I mean? Do you see the difference between me as a white person and perhaps a black person thinking very differently on how they get pulled over? So. Here's something I was going to say about white privilege. Now, we'll get into white privilege perhaps in another message, but just to say something real quick about this. Here's what white privilege is. It doesn't mean that if you grew up white that you automatically had more advantages than any other person in America. Some of that is class or economic status or where you're from or educational opportunities. Some of that is true. So you're not exactly uh, privileged just because you're white but you're not disadvantaged just because of your white skin color. That's the difference between white privilege and the other privilege. You're not disadvantaged or discriminated against simply because of the color of your skin. So that's a big difference. Many people find it unbelievable that their behavior sometimes are guided by these mental uh, reactions and content of which they're, they're unaware right? So those are called mind bugs. Those are called blind spots. Let me give you a biblical example of a blind spot. Do you remember the old prophet Samuel in the Old Testament? He is called uh, to go anoint a new king of Israel. Saul had messed up. 
so many times that God says, you're out. I'm going to find a new king, a man after my own heart. And he tells the prophet Samuel, go down to Judea, go down to the town of Bethlehem, go to the house of Jesse, and one of his sons you are going to anoint as king of Israel. So Samuel goes down there, and he's all ready to anoint somebody. And you remember the story? Samuel sees the first of his sons who walks by, and he's tall, and he's strong, and he's good-looking. And Samuel says in his own heart, he says, well, surely the Lord's going to choose a guy like that. Do you remember what God said to Samuel in that moment? He said, Samuel, you cannot judge somebody based on their outward appearance. Do not consider his appearance, God said to Samuel. These are God's words to Samuel. Do not consider his appearance. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearances, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so if we're going to act more like the Lord, if we're going to act more like Jesus, we've got to see past the cover on the book, right? Don't judge a book by its cover. That's a great meta, uh, uh, metaphor illustration we have. Don't do that. People look at outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. We need to do what God wants us to do. Samuel didn't look at David outwardly. Normally, you'd look at, like normally you and I would look at him. Samuel, God says, don't look at David's appearance. Your prejudices, your biases, Samuel, they're going to make you incorrectly size David up. And then when you do that, you will misjudge David. He is young. And he's doing a lowly job of taking care of the sheep. And because of that, you think he's a nobody and he doesn't merit uh, uh, God's notice or maybe God's choice of him becoming king. But I'm telling you, I have chosen. David, God says to Samuel, I know what's inside David's heart. Samuel, choose him to be the next king of Israel. No matter what he looks like on the outside, Someone's appearance does not reveal what that person is like in their heart on the inside. And here's the point. Appearance alone does not reveal a person's true value. Appearance alone does not reveal a person's true value. Oh, God, help us to put that into practice in our lives because so often we look at people in the outward appearance, we make our mind bugs, we do our blind spots, we make our prejudgments. Help us not to do that. Stop us right now and catch us when we are doing it, Lord, so we won't do it anymore. Amen? Christians, here, here's something else, and I want to say this because we're 44 days from a national election, a very important one. And because we are, I want to say this about Christian theology and politics says, here's the thing, Christian, you cannot allow your politics to guide your theology. If you do that, you've got it backwards. You have to allow your Christian theology to guide your politics. You have to have a Christian worldview. You have to value the things that God values. You have to learn the things that God values because He is bringing in the kingdom of God. And I will tell you, friends, the kingdom of God is not Republican. The kingdom of God is not Democrat. The kingdom of God is not libertarian. You know, it says that, you know, in Christ you're free, but that's not what libertarian's about. Um, we, the kingdom of God is separate from any political party. So don't allow your politics don't allow your theology to be, to be guided by your politics. Your theology should inform your politics, right? So love God, love your neighbor, do good to help other people. What candidate out there reflects the values that, that Christ has? We need to hear when, when we're watching the news because we're going to get inundated with messages. Whether you even watch the news or not, you're still going to hear it a lot in our culture in the next 44 days. And friends, we need to hear with circumcised ears. We need to have good discernment to be able to judge between good and evil and right and wrong. We need not to be contaminated by this world's opinions. We have to recognize we all have our bents, our takes, our slants, even in our thinking and our attitudes toward things. We need to be proactive in our fight for justice, for righteousness, for goodness, for love, and for mercy, and for freedom. Remind yourself of this acrostic. Now, this is awesome because Pastor Jason Kane, an African-American 
pastor in California. He developed this acrostic. Amber was good enough to, re, to redesign it and purpose it with colors that I like even better. And here is our acrostic. We learned this last week. If you weren't with us, uh, it's your first time. If you were with us last week, you probably forgot it, so let's review. Help. Help is our acrostic in this series on God's people, uh, God's view of racial justice and injustice. H-E-L-P. The H is humbly listen. We talked about that last week. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. That's great for marriages too, by the way. There's your marriage counseling for the day. They, so H-E-L-P, the E, we're going to talk about that today, is educate yourself. Humbly listen, educate yourself, love your neighbor, and persist in taking action. We'll talk about the L and the P in the weeks ahead. Right now, let's talk about educate yourself, right? Proverbs 4, 7 uh, says this, getting wisdom. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. How do you develop wisdom? Proverbs says it very clearly. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So get wisdom. Educate yourself. Know what God thinks about something. Knowing there's more than one version of somebody claiming that they have the absolute truth. If you listen to one particular news channel, I'd recommend you for just try it. Try it for a half hour. Your head might explode, but it probably won't. Uh, try going to the other aisle. If you listen to MSNBC or CNN, try going over. <gasps> Did I really say that? Try going over to Fox News and listen to Fox News for a little while. If you only listen to Fox News, try crossing that divide. And oh, it's a big one. And go over to MSNBC or CNN and watch that and say, God, please show me what is true. Please give me discernment as I listen to this and listen to what's going on. I did that this weekend in the last couple of days. It was all around Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her passing and what's going to happen with the Supreme Court nominee and all this stuff. You will hear two completely different views on both sides of the news channels. So watch the news, yes, but pray to God. Ask Him to give you wisdom and discernment. Let's talk about our verse for today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. What has God called us to do? Look, look at these words of the, of the Apostle Paul. For Christ's love compels us. If you have the love of God in your heart, it will compel you to do something about it. You can't just keep it into yourself. Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Let's go on. Paul continues. He says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Oh, if that were true in our lives today, in this, in this world where we need racial justice, we need reconciliation, we need all Christ followers to see with the eyes of Jesus. We regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. And therefore, and this is the truth of what God has done for us in Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Wow, friends, that is such great news. Friends, because of Jesus, because of what he has done for us, we're not just reformed. We're not just re-educated. We're not just rehabilitated. We are recreated in Christ. We are new creation. We are born from above. And now that we live in vital union with Christ Jesus, we're not just turning over a new leaf. We're beginning a new life. Isn't that amazing news? What God has done, it doesn't stop there. They, they, see, there's the beauty of it. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. And God says, this is wonderful. Celebrate it, but don't stop there. Because now that you are a new creation in Christ, God says, I want you to join me in this amazing kingdom enterprise and join him because this world hasn't changed yet. You've changed on the inside, but the world around you hasn't yet changed on the outside. So we have work to do joining with Christ in this mission. 
He says, all this is from God. This is slide 23. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And now he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us. Are you a follower of Christ? If you are, you're us, right? He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Real quick, what is reconciliation? Reconciliation means that God has brought us back into a right relationship with himself. He created man and woman in his image. He created us to live in a living, breathing, love relationship with him. We messed up. We sinned. We went independent from God because he gave us free will. And we went out of a right relationship with God. But God is bringing us back into that right relationship with himself through Christ. This is really interesting, Pastor Michael Todd. Uh, he is a, a wonderful pastor in Tulsa. He's African-American. He pastors Transformation Church, which is one of the greatest churches in the country, um, reaching especially millennials and young adults. And he says this, God says he is no longer counting our skin. Oops, did I say that? He's no longer counting our skin, our sin, I should say, against us. Isn't that, that is just amazing, wonderful news. God has committed to us, the ministry, the message of reconciliation. So what would that reconciliation look like in our world today? Well, I tell you what, God has called us to be cross-cultural, to be justice-oriented people, and we are to go out that way with justice and righteousness and make disciples. We are committed to growing in our sensitivity to other races, to other cultures, to other ethnicities, so that you and I can become better followers and disciple makers of all nations. Now, it's interesting what's on the screen here. The term righteousness of God, right? Right in the end of this verse, Jesus or Paul says these words, God made Jesus, made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, so that in him, in Christ, we could become the righteousness of God. That term, righteousness of God, shares the same root in Hebrew as justice. So in our beloved community, by the way, that's what Dr. Martin Luther King described the Christian community. In our beloved community, we go out as the righteousness and justice of God into our broken world, and we bring them with our lives and with our message, the ministry of reconciliation. So we jump down to slide 26. We're therefore Christ's ambassadors so they could know the truth. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And then in Christ, we are the justice of God. So again, friends, what is discipleship? We're to make disciples of all nations, but it's more than just sharing Jesus with somebody. Yes, it's reading the Bible. Yes, it's praying together. Yes, it is teaching and making friends. How about this? Disciple making could be making friends with and teaching and discipling somebody who is from a different race than you. Somebody who's from a different ethnicity than you. There's a, a book out by a pastor in Chicago, a white pastor in Chicago, and he's, he's talking about white Christianity. And he says, in America today, it, in 75% of white Christian adults in America today, there are still these people where they could not count one close friend who is from another race or another ethnicity than their own white race. Okay, so if that is the case, then the white Christians in America have a little work to do in racial reconciliation, in the ministry of reconciliation to all peoples, all tribes, languages, and people. Uh, friends, we're not to show ra we are not to show favoritism because favoritism is that I prefer one group over another group. I prefer one individual over another individual. I'm only going to reach out to certain people. I'm not even going to give the time of day to other people. And, and Jesus says that's wrong. Jesus' half-brother James says that is wrong. In slide 28 in James 2, the half-brother of Jesus, he's echoing the prophet Samuel. Remember when Samuel said, don't judge people on their outward appearance. God looks at their heart. James says to this, 
in, in verses 8 and 9, he says, if you, if you're a follower of Jesus, he says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, which is love your neighbors yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and you're convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Now, what was James talking about? He's talking about two people come into your church. One of them is well-dressed, wearing fine robes, wearing gold jewelry. Another one comes in in shabby clothes, looks like a homeless person off the street. You give preference to the well-to-do person. You barely acknowledge the other uh, person who, based on their outward appearance, doesn't look worth the time of day to you. And because of your mind bugs, because of your blind spots, you're giving preference and you're discriminating against somebody else. And uh, James is saying, do not do that. In verse 4, have you not discriminated? If you do that, he says, have you not discriminated against uh, somebody among yourselves? Have you not become judges with evil thoughts? Wow, that's, if you take that to heart, the next time you prejudge somebody, the next time you mutter under your breath at watching a news channel, the next time you prefer one person over another because it's your preferred race or gender or economic status or something like that, the next time you do that, remember those words. You discriminated amongst yourselves. You became judges in that moment with evil thoughts. Living out the royal law is what Jesus means by loving your neighbor as yourself. You know, we have a checkered history in America. Uh, when I grew up with American history, I heard nothing mostly but good about American history. Uh, but there are other parts of American history that are not so uh, golden, not so praiseworthy. We are flawed people like everybody else on the planet. And we have our history of discriminating against and oppressing other people. If you look at our nation's history, there are the Native Americans. There are black and African Americans. And just think about this one, number three, how we've discriminated against immigrants in general. Since the 1700s, I was reading an article where these people in the legislature in Pennsylvania were very concerned about the incoming of these immigrant people who were going to change their way of life, who were going to mess up their cultural standards, these German people who were coming into the territory and what a threat they were. So in the 1700s, it began with the Germans, and then it was the Irish, and then it was the Italians, and then it was the Polish, and then it was the Chinese. We did it to the Japanese in World War II. And then now, what are the latest mass group of immigrants? It is the Latinos. And we have done our share of discrimination against every single one of those groups. Americans, just like everybody else in the world who's ethnocentric, which is about every human being, we uh, treat newcomers as different. We seem to have this collective fear of what is different from us. And that fear can feel, can, that the fear can develop into a feeling of being threatened. And then we need to protect ourselves. And so we start treating people like that. Jesus says, throw out all those ideas. Throw out those mind bugs. Throw out those blind spots you have culturally and ethnically and racially. And follow Jesus. Pastor Albert Tate, he's a wonderful African-American pastor in Southern California. He says these words, he says, church, we have this responsibility. We have been transformed by the renewing of our minds. We have the responsibility that each of us is an ambassador of racial reconciliation. And friends, in order to do that, we have to literally, we have to disciple racism out of us. We have to grow in our Christian faith and disciple racism right out of us. Friends, I close with this. Do you know when our work is going to be done? Do you know when we're going to consider it in the Christian faith a success, where we're really going to see the reconciliation in our culture, in our society, in our world today? John the Apostle had a vision of this. John the Apostle saw a vision of heaven of complete racial reconciliation, a wonderful vision of heaven the way it ought to be. In Revelation chapter 7, he said this, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude, millions and millions of people that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, 
people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and that's Jesus. They were wearing white robes. They were, not, they were holding palm trees, which is a sign of peace and welcome to royalty. And in their white robes together, they were crying aloud. They were singing, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to our Lamb. And to the Lamb. What an amazing picture of racial reconciliation right there in heaven. And I can just imagine this. When I said, I said to myself, I said, I can't wait to see that. I can't wait to see that vision become reality in heaven. And the Spirit of God is saying back to us, He says, don't wait. You want to wait to see it in heaven? Don't wait. Start now, right? Start, start thinking and acting that picture of heaven and act in a way to make it a reality here now. Become a minister of reconciliation in your world today and everything that reconciliation means, racially, ethnically, gender, socioeconomically, every single way. And, and when you become a minister of, of reconciliation, you can let go of your blind spots, you can let go of your favoritism, and you can see that God's picture of all the people of every race, every background, every ethnicity, every size, every hair texture, they're all going to be there in heaven with us, and we want to celebrate that together. Now, here's the question as I close. Do you want to be part of that celebration in heaven? If you do, you have to know this. Your ticket, your invitation to get there, it starts with Jesus, and it ends with Jesus. He's the one who's inviting you to be part of that. He says these two words to you, follow me. Are you ready to follow him? Are you ready to follow the great reconciler? Are you ready to follow the one whom Paul described and he said there is one God and there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He is our mediator to a holy father. He is our means of forgiveness for our sins because of his death on the cross. He says you'll have forgiveness and eternal life if you bow your knee and follow him. Are you ready to do that today? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we come to you this morning and we recognize that we have some soul surgery to do in our own hearts. Lord, if we're honest with ourselves, we have our prejudices, we have our discriminations, we have our mind bugs, we have our blind spots, Lord. We confess those to you today. We don't want to be that way anymore. We want to be uh, the kind of people like your spirit told Samuel, that we don't want to look at people on their outward appearance. We want to be like you. We want to look at people in their heart and see them as invaluable creations of you that you made in your image that are worthy of love and respect and honor. Lord, help us to act that way toward our fellow human beings as you make us your ministers of reconciliation to this broken world who needs to know Jesus. Lord Jesus, please come into my life today. I confess my, all my sins to you. Please forgive every one of them. Make me a brand new person from the inside out. You say you can make me a new creation if I trust in you. I'm doing that right now. Make me a new creation. Thank you for it. Thank you for your great love. Thank you that you're changing this world every single day and you're beginning even with me. So, Lord, let me take the new creation that I have on the inside and spread it with love and grace and acceptance to all the people on my outside. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.